first reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels, but do not have love, I am noisy, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoings, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see only a reflection, as in a mirror, but, when we will, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love remain these three, and the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God for the people of God. The second reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sudeces, they gathered together, and one of them, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment is the in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Gospel of our Lord. <coughs> So as I shared with these wonderful youth, uh, I was six, the first time that a beggar approached me for money. So my mom was serving as an associate pastor to a wonderful elder of the church. His name was Reverend Benjamin Rodriguez, and he was an old man even in those days. The man died when I was a, a teenager. Um, I was privileged to witness his ministry, and he was one of the few ordained elders that were also Hispanic, at least in our annual conference. That was the California Pacific Annual Conference. Now, the church's name was La Plaza, and it was located in LA's historic Olvera Street Promenade. It actually sits right next to the Mexican Embassy. And the promenade is full of these, like, carts. You can Google it. You can see all the pretty images stalls, restaurants, gift shops, historic monuments, and all of it seems to be dedicated to reminding LA of its roots in Mexican history, and the church is no different, actually. When you walk into the church, you, it almost looks like an old Spanish mission. It's got these big, like when I was a kid, huge wooden doors, and when you'd walk in, there were steps that went up into the sanctuary, and they are f the, the, I guess you would call it the narthex or foyer, was full of old photos of L.A. back in the day. Um, back even when it was like the Old West. Many a passerby thought that the church was Catholic, but uh, as we'd frequently say, the Catholic church was across the street. Um, in case you've ever been to that area, it's um, Our Lady of Angels is the name of the church. But this was in the mid-80s, okay? So uh, I was given a lot of freedom. I'm sure there are many of you here who can remember being out until the streetlights came on or, you know, it was safe in those days, I guess, 
to, uh, to be able to do those things. It wasn't much different in LA either. Um, when church would let out, I was told, hey, don't go too far away. I had a bad habit of just like bolting out. Um, stay in the plaza in front of the doors. You know, I liked being on my own and I liked being there. Uh, I liked being at the church. I liked being at Olvera Street. It, it had just a vibe that I found beautiful. Well, one Sunday, a beggar approached me for money, and beggars were a plenty, almost as plenty, plentiful as pigeons were. Now you can't find pigeons anywhere when you go to Olvera Street. It's kind of crazy. I don't know what they did with them. Um, and beggars too, by the way. I wasn't afraid when this man approached me. In fact, it was a commonplace occurrence when I was with my family. But that's it. Usually the beggars will approach the adults, not the children. So I was a little surprised that this smelly old white man in rags was talking to a kid, much less a Mexican kid, in a very Mexican part of town. Now I had about 10 bucks in pocket money and I had saved that money after doing a lot of chores. I was very proud of myself. And let me tell you, I used to have, as I was talking with someone earlier, um, we used to have big family gatherings and there was a lot of alcohol consumed at those gatherings. So when I smelled alcohol, I knew what it was and I smelled alcohol on this man's breath amongst other things. And I kept thinking, this guy seems really pathetic. Again, as I ex explained to the children, not pathetic in the I'm making fun of you sense, just very down on his luck. So I told him, all I got is 10 bucks. And I took it out and I shoved it in his hand and he began to cry. And he kept saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, over and over again. I'll never forget his thank yous. I mean, this guy, he was old when I met him. He must be dead now. I'll never know who he was, but I'll never forget his voice. And then he walked away really quickly. And I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel like I'd done good. I didn't feel the loss of the $10. As I said to the kids, I just hoped he might get a shower, you know, at some point. Maybe eat something. And back then, let me tell you, I mean, you know, 10 bucks went a lot further in those days. There were these roach motels that you could get, you know, practically for 30 bucks, you could find a room for the night, you know? And I just hoped that he might find something. Well, that encounter always stayed with me, but it wasn't until I was much older that I began to consider all the things that had happened in the background that ultimately led to me, six-year-old me, six-year-old Mexican me, giving this white man my allowance. And my father, as I mentioned, was furious. He did a lot of yelling. He yelled at me and he said, why did you do that? He's just gonna use the money for alcohol. He needs help from the government, not from you. We said that in those days. My mom only said, you know, hey, it's, it's his money. He earned it. He can spend it how he pleases. I secretly think she was proud of so six-year-old Lem Dominguez didn't really understand and likely could never have been convinced of the structures in play in society that motivated an elderly white man in tattered clothes that stank of alcohol, urine, and body odor to approach a well-fed Mexican-American kid who had 10 bucks in his pocket, practically burning a hole in his pocket to spend on candy or some other frivolity. And all of those structures were emblematic of the power of sin in the world at that time. A power that dehumanizes. A power that didn't care who you were or where you came from because anyone in its grip is just more fuel for the fire that is causing our world to burn. We like to talk about hell as if it's some future terrible consequence of a life poorly lived. No, no. Then as now, we have created our own hell. And we create it through our indifference. Now indifference 
might be an option for the worldly, but it's not an option for the Christian, and more specifically, the Methodist. So the fa- for the past couple of weeks, I've been trying to kind of share with you my knowledge of Methodism and uh, what it means to be a Methodist, why this church is called a Methodist church. And I want to share with you some words from the preface of one of John and Charles Wesley's works. These are the men that founded our denomination. So the name of the book is Hymns and Sacred Poems. And John writes in the preface, If thou wilt be perfect, say they, trouble not thyself about outward works. It is better to work virtues in the will. These are the true worshipers who worship God in spirit and in truth. Directly opposite to this is the gospel of Christ. Solitary religion is not to be found there. The gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Faith working by love is the length and the breadth and the depth and the height of Christian perfection. This commandment have we from Christ, that he who love God love his brother also, and that we manifest our love by doing good unto all men, especially to them that are of the household of faith. So I shortened some of that for the sake of brevity, um, and of course maintaining the original language, which is very male-centric, but I'd be happy to point you to the preface so you can view the exact text. Because you see, we hear so often in church, specifically from scripture, that nothing we do can save us, and that is true. That is the word of scripture. But a mind bent on scripture produces fruit, and that fruit is social holiness. Now, it's not that Wesley didn't believe that personal holiness doesn't exist. Of course it does. He just believes that it must go hand in hand with social holiness, which is really just another way of saying caring for your neighbor. Our salvation from sin isn't just about us. How many times have you heard about earning your golden ticket, getting to heaven? No. It is about everyone and everything around us. So you can imagine then, in a belief system like ours, just how high the stakes are. Wrapped up in our salvation is the very fate of the world. A faith like that acknowledges that systems of sin exist in this world. They are rooted in sin. They produce sin. They cause harm instead of building people up. Now, Methodism started as a movement of people who weren't really looking to change the world. They were just looking to transform their communities. At Oxford College, the Wesleys and their compatriots, they would approach this methodically. They would pray throughout the day. They have very structured prayer times. They would read scripture. They fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays until 3 p.m. Any money they might have used for those meals they saved and gave to the poor. They visited prisoners in debtors' prisons. They even paid their debts to gain freedom. They cared for the sick, they preached, and they educated. And for these actions, they were dubbed religious fanatics, Bible thumpers. They were called the Holy Club by their detractors. And later they earned the nickname Oxford Methodists, because of their methodical approach to their faith. And that's the name that stuck. That's why we're called Methodists. This idea of gathering in groups also stuck. In those days in England, it was common, especially for men, to form societies, which was just a fancy name for club. And the Methodists formed societies too. Those evolved into what were called class meetings. It was a whole model of small group ministry. We might even call it a house church today. And this was a means to help members hold each other accountable for their salvation. It wasn't meant to replace church. 
In fact, it was against the law to miss church. You needed, under the law, as an English person in those days, to attend an Anglican church at least three times in a year, or you were subject to imprisonment. <laughs> Members of class meetings would hear preaching, they would pray, they would talk about their faith, their faith. they would confess their sins to each other. They would sing hymns. It's one of the ways that Charles Wesley's contributions to our hymnody began. They would sing his hymns. And they would engage in mission work. So just like before, Methodists fed the poor. They taught children. They distributed remedies to those who couldn't afford a doctor. They visited the debtors' prisons and relieved debts and performed many other acts of service. And John Wesley even taught members how to manage money, if you can believe it. He was very good at it. He taught them how to stay fit. He published works on these subjects. You might consider looking up a book called Primitive Physic, or An Easy and Natural Method of Curing Most Diseases. Spoiler alert, it's basically about preventative medicine with remedies for specific ailments. It is still prized and researched by the medical community to this day, and it was extremely popular when it was first published. <coughs> Pardon. My intent with this sermon is not to list all the goodness that Methodists did. I'm not trying to clap them on the back and say, good job, good job, no. Instead, what I hope you might be asking yourself is, why did they do any of those things? What was happening in their society that led them to believe that what they were doing were good works? Why were they necessary? The answer isn't so hard to see, and it is clearly visible in our time. We don't have debtors' prisons, of course. We can file for bankruptcy, avoid jail time. But back in those days, there was a time when people who couldn't pay off their debts would be thrown in jail until their debts were paid or excused by their creditors. The instruction of children happened inside the home. The wealthy paid large sums to have their kids instructed, perpetuating generational wealth within a minority of households. And doctors weren't cheap. Doctors paid home visits in those days, but many were very compassionate, as you would expect. However, most people couldn't afford their services, so without them, there really wasn't any health care to speak of. With rampant poverty, injury, and sickness, it would be impossible for those from the lower classes to elevate themselves meaningfully. Then, as now, people would turn to the compassion of the church, where many of the educated of society would come, this was true of Jesus' disciples. When they began ministering after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, they would bring people out into the street for Peter's shadow to just cross over them because it was said that Peter's shadow healed through the power of the Holy Spirit. These days, depending on who you associate with, social justice is a dirty word. I still remember when the language of politicians changed from calling programs for the public good into something we call entitlement programs. We're constantly told to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. But siblings in Christ, that phrase really doesn't square with Christianity. There's nothing like that in the Bible. Quite the opposite, actually. A disciple of Christ takes stock of their world and examines what sin is doing to it, what part they might be playing to perpetuate sin in the world, what they might do to address it. And they never do this alone, never alone, always in a group. Because they recognize that we have an effect on each other, for good or for ill. 
One word spoken carelessly might make the difference for an entire generation. We don't know the power that we wield. And in so doing, systems all around us are affected. Methodist class meetings approach this situation in a very systematic way. They acknowledged its power, and so they governed themselves by rules. They called them the general rules of our united societies. John Wesley wrote, It is therefore expected of all who continue therein that they should continue to evidence their desire of salvation. First, by doing no harm, by avoiding evil of every kind. Secondly, by doing good of every possible sort, as far as possible, to all. And thirdly, by attending upon all of the ordinances of God. Those words were adapted into what we now as Methodists call our general rule of discipleship. And the general rule says, to witness to Jesus Christ in the world and to follow his teachings through acts of compassion, justice, worship, and devotion under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. May the God of all compassion and love motivate you to continue to strengthen your discipleship as the Holy Spirit gives you power. May you be bold and courageous in calling upon that power. Because, siblings in Christ, that power is yours for the asking, and it has been yours since the day of your birth. It has been passed down from generation to generation because people know that healing and salvation can be found in Jesus Christ. Glory be to God, and amen.